thus effected. Moreover, whenever complicated experiments are in progress, so careful an observer as Gardner would have castrated his hybrids, and this would have ensured in each generation a cross with pollen from a distinct flower, either from the same plant or from another plant of the same hybrid structure. And, thus, the strange fact of an increase of fertility in the successive generations of artificially fertilized hybrids, in contrast with those spontaneously self-fertilized, may, as I believe, be accounted for by too close interbreeding having been avoided. Now let us turn to the results arrived at by a third most experienced hybridizer, namely the Honorable and Reverend W. Herbert. He is as emphatic in his conclusion that some hybrids are perfectly fertile, as fertile as the pure parent species, as are Colewriter and Gardner, that some degree of sterility between distinct species is a universal law of nature. He experimented on some of the very same species as did Gardner. The differences in their results may, I think, be in part accounted for by Herbert's great horticultural skill and by his having hot houses at his command. Of his many important statements, I will here give only a single one as an example, namely that, quote, Every ovule in a pod of crinum capens, fertilized by crinum revolutum, produced a plant which I never saw to occur in the case of its natural fecundation. End quote. So that here we have perfect, or even more than commonly perfect, sterility in a first cross between two distinct species. This case of the crinum leads me to refer to a singular fact. Namely, that individual plants of certain species of Lobelia, Verbascum, and Passiflora can easily be fertilized by the pollen from a distinct species, but not by pollen from the same plant, though this pollen can be proved to be perfectly sound by fertilizing other plants or species. In the genus Hepiastrum, in Corydalis, as shown by Professor Hildebrand, in various orchids, as shown by Mr. Scott and Fritz Müller, all the individuals are in this peculiar condition, so that with some species certain abnormal individuals, and in other species all the individuals, can actually be hybridized much more readily than they can be fertilized by pollen from the same individual plant. To give one instance, a bulb of Hepaeastrum alicum produced four flowers, Three were fertilized by Herbert with their own pollen, and the fourth was subsequently fertilized by the pollen of a compound hybrid descended from three distinct species. The result was that, quote, the ovaries of the three first flowers soon ceased to grow, and after a few days perished entirely, whereas the pod impregnated by the pollen of the hybrid made vigorous growth and rapid progress to maturity and bore good seed, which vegetated freely. End quote. Mr. Herbert tried similar experiments during many years, and always with the same result. These cases serve to show on what slight and mysterious causes a lesser or greater fertility of a species sometimes depends. The practical experiments of horticulturists, though not made with scientific precision, deserve some notice. It is notorious in how complicated a manner of the species of Pelargonium, Fuchsia, Calceolaria, Petunia, Rhododendron, etc., have been crossed, yet many of these hybrids seed freely. For instance, Herbert asserts that a hybrid from Integrifolia and Plantagenia, species most widely dissimilar in general habit, quote, reproduces itself as perfectly as if it had been a natural species from the mountains of Chile, end quote. I have taken some pains to ascertain the degree of fertility of some of the complex crosses of rhododendrons, and I am assured that many of them are perfectly fertile. Mr. C. Noble, for instance, informs me that he raises stocks for grafting from a hybrid between rhododendrum ponticum and rhododendrum cataubiens, and that this hybrid, quote, 
seeds as freely as it is possible to imagine, end quote. Had hybrids, when fairly treated, always gone on decreasing in fertility in each successive generation, as Gardner believed to be the case, the fact would have been notorious to nurserymen. Horticulturalists raise large beds of the same hybrid, and such alone are fairly treated, for by insect agency the several individuals are allowed to cross freely with each other, and the injurious influence of close interbreeding is thus prevented. Anyone may readily convince himself of the efficiency of insect agency by examining the flowers of the more sterile kinds of hybrid rhododendrons, which produce no pollen, for you will find on their stigmas plenty of pollen brought from other flowers. In regard to animals, much fewer experiments have been carefully tried than with plants. If our systematic arrangements can be trusted, that is, if the genera of animals are as distinct from each other as are the genera of plants, then we may infer that animals more widely distinct in the scale of nature can be crossed more easily than in the case of plants. But the hybrids themselves are, I think, more sterile. It should, however, be borne in mind that, owing to few animals breeding freely under confinement, few experiments have been fairly tried. For instance, the canary bird has been crossed with nine distinct species of finches, but as not one of these breeds freely in confinement, we have no right to expect that the first crosses between them and the canary, or that their hybrids, should be perfectly fertile. Again, with respect to the fertility in successive generations of the more fertile hybrid animals, I hardly know of an instance in which two families of the same hybrid have been raised at the same time from different parents, so as to avoid the ill effects of close interbreeding. On the contrary, brothers and sisters have usually been crossed in each successive generation in opposition to the constantly repeated admonition of every breeder. And in this case, it is not at all surprising that the inherent sterility in the hybrids should have gone on increasing. Although I know of hardly any thoroughly well-authenticated cases of perfectly fertile hybrid animals, I have reason to believe that the hybrids from Cervulus vaginalis and Rivesi, and from Phasianus colchicus with Phasianus torquatus, are perfectly fertile. M. Quatrophagus states that the hybrids from two moths, Bombyx cynthia and Arindia, were proved in Paris to be fertile, inter se, for eight generations. It has lately been asserted that two such distinct species as the hare and rabbit, when they can be got to breed together, produce offspring, which are highly fertile when crossed with one of the parent species. The hybrids from the common and Chinese geese, a. signoides, species which are so different that they generally ranked in distinct genera, have often bred in this country with either pure parent, and in one single instance, they have bred inter se. This was effected by Mr. Eaton, who raised two hybrids from the same parents, but from different hatches, and from these two birds, he raised no less than eight hybrids, grandchildren of the pure geese, from one nest. In India, however, these crossbred geese must be far more fertile, for I am assured by two eminently capable judges, namely Mr. Blythe and Captain Hutton, that whole flocks of these crossed geese are kept in various parts of the country, and as they are kept for profit, where neither pure parent species exists, they must certainly be highly or perfectly fertile. With our domesticated animals, the various races, when crossed together, are quite fertile, yet in many cases they are descended from two or more wild species. From this fact, we must conclude either that the aboriginal parent species are first produced perfectly fertile hybrids, or that the hybrids subsequently reared under domestication became quite fertile. This latter alternative, which was first propounded by Pallas, seems by far the most probable, and can, indeed, hardly be doubted. It is, for instance, almost certain that our dogs are descended from several wild stocks, yet, with perhaps the exception of certain indigenous domestic dogs of South America, 
all are quite fertile together. But analogy makes me greatly doubt whether the several aboriginal species would at first have freely bred together and have produced quite fertile hybrids. So, again, I have lately acquired decisive evidence that the crossed offspring from the Indian hummed and common cattle are inter se perfectly fertile, and from the observations by Rutemeyer on their important osteological differences, as well as those by Mr. Blythe on their differences in habits, voice, constitution, etc., these two forms must be regarded as good and distinct species. The same remarks may be extended to the two chief races of the pig. We must, therefore, either give up the belief of the universal sterility of species when crossed, or we must look at this sterility in animals not as an indelible characteristic, but as one capable of being removed by domestication. Finally, considering all the ascertained facts on the intercrossing of plants and animals, it may be concluded that some degree of sterility, both in first crosses and in hybrids, is an extremely general result, but that it cannot, under our present state of knowledge, be considered as absolutely universal. Laws Governing the Sterility of First Crosses and of Hybrids We will now consider a little more in detail the laws governing the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids. Our chief object will be to see whether or not these laws indicate that species have been specially endowed with this quality in order to prevent their crossing and blending together in utter confusion. The following conclusions are drawn up chiefly from Gartner's admirable work on the hybridization of plants. I have taken much pains to ascertain how far they apply to animals and considering how scanty our knowledge is in regard to hybrid animals. It has been already remarked that the degree of fertility, both of first crosses and of hybrids, graduates from zero to perfect fertility. It is surprising in how many curious ways this gradation can be shown, but only the barest outline of the facts can here be given. When pollen from a plant of one family is placed on the stigma of a plant of a distinct family, it exerts no more influence than so much in organic dust. From this absolute zero of fertility, the pollen of different species applied to the stigma of some one species of the same genus yields a perfect gradation in the number of seeds produced up to nearly complete or even quite complete fertility, and, as we have seen, in certain abnormal cases, even to an excess of fertility beyond that which the plant's own pollen produces. So, in hybrids themselves, there are some which never have produced, and probably never would produce, even with the pollen of the pure parents, a single fertile seed. But in some of these cases, the first trace of fertility may be detected by the pollen of one of the pure parent species, causing the flower of the hybrid to wither earlier than it otherwise would have done. And the early withering of the flower is well known to be a sign of incipient fertilization. From this extreme degree of sterility, we have self-fertilized hybrids producing a greater and greater number of seeds up to perfect fertility. The hybrids raised from two species, which are very difficult to cross, and which rarely produce any offspring, are generally very sterile. But the parallelism between the difficulty of making a first cross and the sterility of the hybrids thus produced, two classes of facts which are generally confounded together, is by no means strict. There are many cases in which two pure species, as in the genus Verbascum, can be united with unusual facility and produce numerous hybrid offspring, yet these hybrids are remarkably sterile. On the other hand, there are species which can be crossed very rarely or with extreme difficulty, but the hybrids, when at last produced, are very fertile. Even within the limits of the same genus, for instance in Dianthus, these two opposite cases occur. The fertility, both of first crosses and of hybrids, is more easily affected by unfavorable conditions than is that of pure species. But the fertility of first crosses is likewise innately variable, for it is not always the same in degree when the same two species are crossed under the same circumstances.
It depends in part on the construction of the individuals, which happen to have been chosen for the experiment. So it is with hybrids, for their degree of fertility is often found to differ greatly in the several individuals raised from seed out of the same capsule and exposed to the same condition. By the term systematic affinity is meant the general resemblance between species in structure and constitution. Now, the fertility of first crosses and of the hybrids produced from them is largely governed by their systematic affinity. This is clearly shown by hybrids, never having been raised between species, ranked by systematists in distinct families, and, on the other hand, by very closely allied species, generally uniting with facility. But the correspondence between systematic affinity and the facility of crossing is by no means strict. A multitude of cases could be given of very closely allied species, which will not unite, or only with extreme difficulty, and on the other hand, of very distinct species which unite with the utmost facility. In the same family there may be a genus, as Dianthus, in which very many species can most readily be crossed, and another genus, as Silene, in which the most persevering efforts have failed to produce between extremely close species of a single hybrid. Even within the limits of the same genus, we meet with this same difference. For instance, the many species of Nicotiana have been more largely crossed than the species of almost any other genus, but Gartner found that Nicotania acuminata, which is not a particularly distinct species, obstinately failed to fertilize, or to be fertilized, by no less than eight other species of Nicotiana. Many analogous facts could be given. No one has been able to point out what kind or what amount of difference in any recognizable character is sufficient to prevent two species crossing. It can be shown that plants most widely different in habit and general appearance, and having strongly marked differences in every part of the flower, even in the pollen, in the fruit, and in the cotyledons, can be crossed. Annual and perennial plants, deciduous and evergreen trees, plants inhabiting different stations and fitted for extremely different climates, can often be crossed with ease. By a reciprocal cross between two species, I mean the case, for instance, of a female ass being first crossed by a stallion, and then a mare by a male ass, these two species may then be said to have been reciprocally crossed. There is often the widest possible difference in the facility of making reciprocal crosses. Such cases are highly important, for they prove that the capacity in any two species to cross is often completely independent of their systematic affinity, that is, of any difference in their structure or constitution, excepting in their reproductive systems. The diversity of the result in reciprocal crosses between the same two species was long ago observed by Kohlreiter. To give an instance, Mirabilis longiflora, and the hybrids thus produced are sufficiently fertile. But Kohlreiter tried more than two hundred times during eight following years to fertilize reciprocally Mirabilis longiflora with the pollen of Mirabilis chalapa, and utterly failed. Several other equally striking cases could be given. Thuret has observed the same facts with certain seaweeds, or fuci. Gartner, moreover, found that this difference of facility in making reciprocal crosses is extremely common in a lesser degree. He has observed it even between closely related forms, as in Mathiola annua and Glabra, which many botanists rank only as varieties. It is also a remarkable fact that hybrids raised from reciprocal crosses, though of course compounded of the very same two species, the one species having first been used as the father and then as the mother, though they rarely differ in external characters, yet differ in fertility in a small and occasionally in a high degree. Several other singular rules could be given from Gartner. For instance, some species have a remarkable power of crossing with other species. Other species of the same genus have a remarkable power of impressing their likeness on their hybrid offspring. But these two powers do not at all necessarily go together. 
There are certain hybrids which, instead of having, as is usual, an intermediate character between their two parents, always closely resemble one of them, and such hybrids, though externally so like one of their pure parent species, are, with rare exceptions, extremely sterile. So again, among hybrids which are usually intermediate in structure between their parents, exceptional and abnormal individuals sometimes are born, which closely resemble one of their pure parents. And these hybrids are almost always utterly sterile, even when the other hybrids raised from seed, from the same capsule, have a considerable degree of fertility. These facts show how completely the fertility of a hybrid may be independent of its external resemblance to either pure parent. Considering the several rules now given, which govern the fertility of first crosses and of hybrids, we see that when forms, which must be considered as good and distinct species, are united, their fertility graduates from zero to perfect fertility, or even to fertility under certain conditions, in excess, that their fertility, besides being eminently susceptible to favorable and unfavorable conditions, is innately variable, that it is by no means always the same in degree in the first cross and in the hybrids produced from this cross, that the fertility of hybrids is not related to the degree in which they resemble, in external appearance, either parent, and, lastly, that the facility of making a first cross between any two species is not always governed by their systematic affinity or degree of resemblance to each other. This latter statement is clearly proved by the difference in the result of reciprocal crosses between the same two species, for according as the one species or the other is used as the father or the mother, there is generally some difference, and occasionally the widest possible difference, in the facility of effecting a union. The hybrids, moreover, produced from reciprocal crosses, often differ in fertility. Now, do these complex and singular rules indicate the species have been endowed with sterility simply to prevent their becoming confounded in nature? I think not, for why should the sterility be so extremely different in degree when various species are crossed, all of which we must suppose it would be equally important to keep from blending together? Why should the degree of sterility be innately variable in the individuals of the same species? Why should some species cross with facility and yet produce very sterile hybrids, and other species cross with extreme difficulty and yet produce fairly fertile hybrids? Why should there often be so great a difference in the result of a reciprocal cross between the same two species? Why, it may even be asked, has the production of hybrids been permitted? To grant to species the special power of producing hybrids, and then to stop their further propagation by different degrees of sterility, not strictly related to the facility of the first union between their parents, seems a strange arrangement. The foregoing rules and facts, on the other hand, appear to me clearly to indicate that the sterility, both of first crosses and of hybrids, is simply incidental or dependent on unknown differences in their reproductive systems, the differences being of so peculiar and limited a nature that, in reciprocal crosses between the same two species, the male sexual element of the one will often freely act on the female sexual element of the other, but not in a reversed direction. It will be advisable to explain a little more fully by an example what I mean by sterility being incidental on other differences and not a specially endowed quality. As the capacity of one plant to be grafted or budded on another is unimportant for their welfare in a state of nature, I presume that no one will suppose that this capacity is a specially endowed quality, but will admit that it is incidental on differences in the laws of growth of the two plants. We can sometimes see the reason why one tree will not take on another from differences in their rate of growth, in the hardness of their wood, in the period of the flow or nature of their sap, etc., but in a multitude of cases we can assign no reason whatever. Great diversity in the size of two plants, one being woody and the other herbaceous, one being evergreen and the other deciduous, and adaptation to widely different climates, 
does not always prevent the two grafting together. As in hybridization, so with grafting, the capacity is limited by systematic affinity, for no one has been able to graft together trees belonging to quite distinct families. And, on the other hand, closely allied species and varieties of the same species can usually, but not invariably, be grafted with ease. But this capacity, as in hybridization, is by no means absolutely governed by systematic affinity. Although many distinct genera within the same family have been grafted together, in other cases, species of the same genus will not take on each other. The pair can be grafted far more readily on the quince, which is ranked as a distinct genus, than on the apple, which is a member of the same genus. Even different varieties of the pear take with different degrees of facility on the quince, so do different varieties of the apricot and peach on certain varieties of the plum, as Gartner found that there was sometimes an innate difference in different individuals of the same two species in crossing. So, Sagaret believes this to be the case with different individuals of the same two species in being grafted together. As in reciprocal crosses, the facility of effecting a union is often very far from equal, so it sometimes is in grafting. The common gooseberry, for instance, cannot be grafted on the current, whereas the current will take, though with difficulty, on the gooseberry. We have seen that the sterility of hybrids which have their reproductive organs in an imperfect condition is a different case from the difficulty of uniting two pure species which have their reproductive organs perfect, yet these two distinct classes of cases run, to a large extent, parallel. Something analogous occurs in grafting, for Thouen found that three species of Robinia, which seeded freely on their own roots, and which could be grafted with no great difficulty on a fourth species, when thus grafted, were rendered barren. On the other hand, certain species of sorbus, when grafted on other species, yielded twice as much fruit as when on their own roots. We are reminded by this latter fact of the extraordinary cases of hepaestrum, passiflora, etc., which seed much more freely when fertilized with the pollen of a distinct species than when fertilized with pollen from the same plant. We thus see although there is a clear and great difference between the mere adhesion of grafted stocks and the union of the male and female elements in the act of reproduction, yet that there is a rude degree of parallelism in the results of grafting and of crossing distinct species, and as we must look at the curious and complex laws governing the facility with which trees can be grafted on each other as incidental on unknown differences in their vegetative systems, so, I believe that the still more complex laws governing the facility of the first crosses are incidental on unknown differences in their reproductive systems. These differences in both cases follow, to a certain extent, as might have been expected, systematic affinity, by which term every kind of resemblance and dissimilarity between organic beings is attempted to be expressed. The facts by no means seem to indicate that the greater or lesser difficulty of either grafting or crossing various species has been a special endowment, though in the case of crossing, the difficulty is as important for the endurance and stability of the specific forms, as in the case of grafting, it is unimportant for their welfare. At one time it appeared to me probable, as it has to others, that the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids might have been slowly acquired through the natural selection of slightly lessened degrees of fertility, which, like any other variation, spontaneously appeared in certain individuals of one variety, when crossed with those of another variety, for it would clearly be advantageous to two varieties or incipient species if they could be kept from blending, on the same principle that, when man is selecting at the same time two varieties, it is necessary that he should keep them separate. In the first place, it may be remarked that species inhabiting distinct regions are often sterile when crossed. Now it could clearly have been of no advantage to such separated species to have been rendered mutually sterile. And consequently this could not have been effected through natural selection, 
but it may perhaps be argued that if a species was rendered sterile with some one compatriot, sterility with other species would follow as a necessary contingency. In the second place, it is almost as much opposed to the theory of natural selection as to that of special creation, that in reciprocal crosses the male element of one form should have been rendered utterly impotent on a second form, while at the same time the male element of this second form is enabled freely to fertilize the first form, for this peculiar state of the reproductive system could hardly have been advantageous to either species. In considering the probability of natural selection having come into action, in rendering species mutually sterile, the greatest difficulty will be found to lie in the existence of many graduated steps from slightly lessened fertility to absolute sterility. It may be admitted that it would profit an incipient species if it were rendered in some slight degree sterile when crossed with its parent form or with some other variety, for thus fewer bastardized and deteriorated offspring would be produced to commingle their blood with the new species in the process of formation. But he who will take the trouble to reflect on the steps by which this first degree of sterility could be increased through natural selection to that high degree, which is common with so many species, and which is universal with species which have been differentiated to a generic or family rank, will find the subject extraordinarily complex. After mature reflection, it seems to me that this could not have been effected through natural selection. Take the case of any two species which, when crossed, produced few and sterile offspring. Now, what is there which could favor the survival of those individuals which happen to be endowed in a slightly higher degree with mutual infertility, and which thus approached by one small step towards absolute sterility? Yet, on advance of this kind, if the theory of natural selection be brought to bear, must have incessantly accord with many species, for a multitude are mutually quite barren. With sterile neuter insects, we have reason to believe that modifications in their structure and fertility have been slowly accumulated by natural selection, from an advantage having been thus indirectly given to the community to which they belonged, over other communities of the same species. But an individual animal not belonging to a social community, if rendered slightly sterile, when crossed with some other variety, would not thus itself gain any advantage, or indirectly give any advantage to the other individuals of the same variety, thus leading to their preservation. But it would be superfluous to discuss this question in detail, for with plants we have conclusive evidence that the sterility of crossed species must be due to some principle quite independent of natural selection. Both Gartner and Kohlreiter have proved that in genera, including numerous species, a series can be formed from species which, when crossed, yield fewer and fewer seeds, to species which never produce a single seed, but yet are affected by the pollen of certain other species, for the German swells. It is here manifestly impossible to select the more sterile individuals which have already ceased to yield seeds, so that this acme of sterility, when the germen alone is effected, cannot have been gained through selection, and from the laws governing the various grades of sterility, being so uniform throughout the animal and vegetable kingdoms, we may infer that the cause, whatever it may be, is the same, or nearly the same, in all cases. We will now look a little closer at the probable nature of the differences between species which induce sterility in first crosses and in hybrids. In the case of first crosses, the greater or less difficulty in effecting a union and in obtaining offspring apparently depends on several distinct causes. There must sometimes be a physical impossibility in the male element reaching the ovule, as would be the case with a plant having a pistil too long for the pollen tubes to reach the ovarium. It has also been observed that when the pollen of one species is placed on the stigma of a distinctly allied species, though the pollen tubes protrude, they do not penetrate the stigmatic surface. Again, the male element may reach the female element, but be incapable of causing an embryo to be developed, as seems to have been the case with some of Thuret's experiments on fuci. 
No explanation can be given of these facts any more than why certain trees cannot be grafted on others. Lastly, an embryo may be developed and then perish at an early period. This latter alternative has not been sufficiently attended to, but I believe from observations communicated to me by Mr. Hewitt, who has had great experience in hybridizing pheasants and fowls, that the early death of the embryo is a very frequent cause of sterility in first crosses. Mr. Salter has recently given the results of an examination of about 500 eggs produced from various crosses between three species of gallus and their hybrids. The majority of these eggs had been fertilized, and in the majority of the fertilized eggs, the embryos had either been partially developed and had then perished, or had become nearly mature. But the young chickens had been unable to break through the shell. Of the chickens which were born, more than four-fifths died within the first few days, or, at latest, weeks, quote, without any obvious cause, apparently from mere inability to live, end quote, so that from the five hundred eggs only twelve chickens were reared. With plants, hybridized embryos probably often perish in a like manner. At least it is known that hybrids raised from very distinct species are sometimes weak and dwarfed and perish at an early age, of which fact Max Wychura has recently given some striking cases with hybrid willows. It may be here worth noticing that in some cases of parthenogenesis, the embryos within the eggs of silk moths, which had not been fertilized, pass through their early stages of development, and then perish like the embryos produced by a cross between distinct species. Until becoming acquainted with these facts, I was unwilling to believe in the frequent early death of hybrid embryos, for hybrids, when once born, are generally healthy and long-lived, as we see in the case of the common mule. Hybrids, however, are differently circumstanced before and after birth. When born and living in a country where their two parents live, they are generally placed under suitable conditions of life, but a hybrid partakes of only half of the nature and constitution of its mother. It may, therefore, be for birth, as long as it is nourished within its mother's womb, or within the egg or seed produced by the mother, be exposed to conditions in some degree unsuitable, and consequently be liable to perish at an early period, more especially, as all very young beings are eminently sensitive to injurious or unnatural conditions of life. But after all, the cause more probably lies in some imperfection in the original act of impregnation causing the embryo to be imperfectly developed, rather than in the conditions to which it is subsequently exposed. In regard to the sterility of hybrids in which the sexual elements are imperfectly developed, the case is somewhat different. I have more than once alluded to a large body of facts showing that, when animals and plants are removed from their natural conditions, they are extremely liable to have their reproductive systems seriously affected. This, in fact, is the great bar to the domestication of animals. Between the sterility thus superinduced and that of hybrids, there are many points of similarity. In both cases, the sterility is independent of general health and is often accompanied by excess of size or great luxuriance. In both cases, the sterility occurs in various degrees. In both, the male element is the most liable to be affected but sometimes the female more than the male. In both, the tendency goes to a certain extent with systematic affinity, for whole groups of animals and plants are rendered impotent by the same unnatural conditions, and whole groups of species tend to produce sterile hybrids. On the other hand, one species in a group will sometimes resist great changes of conditions with unimpaired fertility and certain species in a group will produce unusually fertile hybrids. No one can tell, till he tries, whether any particular animal will breed under confinement, or any exotic plant seed freely under culture, nor can he tell, till he tries, whether any two species of a genus will produce more or less sterile hybrids. Lastly, when organic beings are placed during several generations, 
under conditions not natural to them, they are extremely liable to vary, which seems to be partly due to their reproductive systems having been especially affected, though in a lesser degree, than when sterility ensues. So it is with hybrids, for their offspring in successive generations are eminently liable to vary, as every experimentalist has observed. Thus we see that when organic beings are placed under new and unnatural conditions, and when hybrids are produced by the unnatural crossing of two species, the reproductive system, independently of the general state of health, is affected in a very similar manner. In one case, the conditions of life have been disturbed, though often in so slight a degree as to be inappreciable by us. In the other case, or that of hybrids, the external conditions have remained the same, but the organization has been disturbed by two distinct structures and constitutions, including, of course, the reproductive systems, having been blended into one. For it is scarcely possible that two organizations should be compounded into one, without some disturbance occurring in the development or periodical action or mutual relations of the different parts and organs one to another, or to the conditions of life. When hybrids are able to breed, inter se, they transmit to their offspring, from generation to generation, the same compounded organization, and hence we need not be surprised that their sterility, though in some degree variable, does not diminish. It is even apt to increase, this being generally the result, as before explained, of too close interbreeding. The above view of the the sterility of hybrids being caused by two constitutions, being compounded into one, has been strongly maintained by Max Weichura. It must, however, be owned that we cannot understand, on the above, or any other view, several facts with respect to the sterility of hybrids. For instance, the unequal fertility of hybrids produced from reciprocal crosses or the increased sterility in those hybrids which occasionally and exceptionally resemble closely either pure parent. Nor do I pretend that the foregoing remarks go to the root of the matter. No explanation is offered why an organism, when placed under unnatural conditions, is rendered sterile. All that I have attempted to show is that in two cases, in some respects allied, sterility is the common result in the one case, from the conditions of life having been disturbed, in the other case, from the organization having been disturbed by two organizations being compounded into one. A similar parallelism holds good with an allied yet very different class of facts. It is an old and almost universal belief, founded on a considerable body of evidence, which I have elsewhere given, that slight changes in the conditions of life are beneficial to all living things. We see this acted on by farmers and gardeners in their frequent exchanges of seed, tubers, etc., from one soil or climate to another and back again. During the convalescence of animals, great benefit is derived from almost any change in their habits of life. Again, both with plants and animals, there is the clearest evidence that a cross between individuals of the same species, which differ to a certain extent, gives vigor and fertility to the offspring, and that close interbreeding continues during several generations between the nearest relations, if these be kept under the same conditions of life, almost always lead to decreased size, weakness, or sterility. Hence it seems that, on the one hand, Slight changes in the conditions of life benefit all organic beings, and on the other hand, that slight crosses, that is, crosses between the males and females of the same species, which have been subjected to slightly different conditions, or which have slightly varied, give vigor and fertility to the offspring. But, as we have seen, organic beings long habituated to certain uniform conditions under a state of nature, when subjected, as under confinement, to a considerable change in their conditions, very frequently are rendered more or less sterile, and we know that a cross between two forms that have become widely or specifically different produce hybrids which are almost always in some degree sterile. I am fully persuaded that this double parallelism 
is by no means an accident or an illusion. He who is able to explain why the elephant and a multitude of other animals are incapable of breeding, when kept under only partial confinement, in their native country, will be able to explain the primary cause of hybrids being so generally sterile. He will at the same time be able to explain how it is that the races of some of our domestic animals, which have often been subjected to new and not uniform conditions, are quite fertile together, although they are descended from distinct species, which would probably have been sterile if aboriginally crossed. The above two parallel series of facts seem to be connected together by some common but unknown bond, which is essentially related to the principle of life. This principle, according to Mr. Herbert Spencer, being that life depends on, or consists in, the incessant action and reaction of various forces, which, as throughout nature, are always tending towards an equilibrium, and when this tendency is slightly disturbed by any change, the vital forces gain in power. End of chapter 9, part 1Chapter 9, Part 2 of The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Armenta. Reciprocal Dimorphism and Trimorphism. This subject may be here briefly discussed and will be found to throw some light on hybridism. Several plants belonging to distinct orders present two forms which exist in about equal numbers and which differ in no respect except in their reproductive organs, one form having a long pistil with short stamens, the other a short pistil with long stamens, the two having differently sized pollen grains. With trimorphic plants there are three forms likewise differing in the lengths of their pistils and stamens, in the size and color of the pollen grains, and in some other respects, and as in each of the three forms, there are two sets of stamens. The three forms possess together six sets of stamen and three kinds of pistils. These organs are so proportioned in length to each other that half the stamens in two of the forms stand on a level with the stigma of the third form. Now I have shown, and the result has been confirmed by other observers, that in order to obtain full fertility with these plants, it is necessary that the stigma of the one form should be fertilized by pollen taken from the stamens of corresponding height with another form, so that with dimorphic species two unions, which may be called legitimate, are fully fertile, and two, which may be called illegitimate, are more or less infertile. With trimorphic species six unions are legitimate, or fully fertile, and twelve are illegitimate, or more or less infertile. The infertility which may be observed in various dimorphic and trimorphic plants, when they are illegitimately fertilized, that is, by pollen taken from stamens not corresponding in height with the pistil, differs much in degree, up to absolute and utter sterility, just in the same manner as occurs in crossing distinct species. As the degree of sterility in the latter case depends, in an eminent degree, on the conditions of life being more or less favorable, so I have found it with illegitimate unions. It is well known that if pollen of a distinct species be placed on the stigma of a flower, and its own pollen be afterwards, even after a considerable interval of time, placed on the same stigma, its action is so strongly prepotent that it generally annihilates the effect of the foreign pollen. So it is with the pollen of the several forms of the same species, for legitimate pollen is strongly prepotent over illegitimate pollen, and both are placed on the same stigma. I ascertain this by fertilizing several flowers, first illegitimately, and twenty-four hours afterwards legitimate, with pollen taken from a peculiarly colored variety, and all the seedlings were similarly colored. This shows that the legitimate pollen 
though applied twenty-four hours subsequently, had wholly destroyed or prevented the action of the previously applied illegitimate pollen. Again, as in making reciprocal crosses between the same two species, there is occasionally a great difference in the result, so the same thing occurs with trimorphic plants. For instance, the mid-styled form of Lythrum salicaria was illegitimately fertilized with the greatest ease by pollen from the longer stamens of the short-styled form, and yielded many seeds. But the latter form did not yield a single seed when fertilized by the longer stamens of the mid-styled form. In all these respects, and in others, which might be added, the forms of the same undoubted species, when illegitimately united, behave in exactly the same manner as do two distinct species when crossed. This led me carefully to observe, during four years, many seedlings raised from illegitimate unions. The chief result is that these illegitimate plants, as may be called, are not fully fertile. It is possible to raise from dimorphic species, both long-styled and short-styled illegitimate plants, and from trimorphic plants, all three illegitimate forms. These can then be properly united in a legitimate manner. When this is done, there is no apparent reason why they should not yield as many seeds as did their parents when legitimately fertilized, but such is not the case. They are all infertile in various degrees, some being so utterly and incurably sterile that they did not yield during four seasons a single seed or even seed capsule. The sterility of these illegitimate plants when united with each other in a legitimate manner may be strictly compared with that of hybrids when crossed inter se. If, on the other hand, a hybrid is crossed with either pure parent species, the sterility is usually much lessened, and so it is when an illegitimate plant is fertilized by a legitimate plant. In the same manner, as the sterility of hybrids does not always run parallel with the difficulty of making the first cross between the two parent species, so that sterility of certain illegitimate plants was unusually great, while the sterility of the union from which they were derived was by no means great. With hybrids raised from the same seed capsule, the degree of sterility is innately variable. So it is in a marked manner with illegitimate plants. Lastly, many hybrids are profuse and persistent flowerers, while other and more sterile hybrids produce few flowers and are weak, miserable dwarfs. Exactly similar cases occur with the illegitimate offspring of various dimorphic and trimorphic plants. Altogether, there is the closest identity in character and behavior between illegitimate plants and hybrids. It is hardly an exaggeration to maintain that illegitimate plants are hybrids produced within the limits of the same species by the improper union of certain forms, while ordinary hybrids are produced from an improper union between so-called distinct species. We have also already seen that there is the closest similarity in all respects between first illegitimate unions and first crosses between distinct species. This will perhaps be made more fully apparent by an illustration. We may suppose that a botanist found two well-marked varieties, and such occur, of the long-styled form of the trimorphic Lythrum salicaria, and that he determined to try by crossing whether they were specifically distinct. He would find that they yielded only about one-fifth of the proper number of seed, and that they behaved, in all the other above-specified respects, as if they had been two distinct species. But to make the case sure, he would raise plants from his supposed hybridized seed, and he would find that the seedlings were miserably dwarfed and utterly sterile, and that they behaved, in all other aspects, like ordinary hybrids. He might then maintain that he had actually proved, in accordance with the common view, that his two varieties were as good and as distinct species as any in the world. But he would be completely mistaken. The facts now given on dimorphic and trimorphic plants are important because they show us, first, 
that the physiological test of lessened fertility, both in first crosses and in hybrids, is no safe criterion of specific distinction. Secondly, because we may conclude that there is some unknown bond which connects the infertility of illegitimate unions with that of their illegitimate offspring. And we are led to extend the same view to first crosses and hybrids. Thirdly, because we find, and this seems to me of especial importance, that two or three forms of the same species may exist and may differ in no respect whatever, either in structure or in constitution, relatively to external conditions, and yet be sterile when united in certain ways. For we must remember that it is the union of the sexual elements of individuals of the same form, for instance, of two long-styled forms, which result in sterility, while it is the union of the sexual elements proper to two distinct forms which is fertile. Hence, the case appears, at first sight, exactly the reverse of what occurs in the ordinary unions of the individuals of the same species, and with crosses between distinct species. It is, however, doubtful whether this is really so, but I will not enlarge on this obscure subject. We may, however, infer, as probable from the consideration of dimorphic and trimorphic plants, that the sterility of distinct species, when crossed, and of their hybrid progeny, depends exclusively on the nature of their sexual elements, and not on any difference in their structure or general constitution. We are also led to the same conclusion by considering reciprocal crosses, in which the male of one species cannot be united, or can be united with great difficulty, with the female of a second species, while the converse cross can be effected with perfect facility. That excellent observer, Gardner, likewise concluded that species, when crossed, are sterile owing to differences confined to their reproductive systems. Fertility of varieties when crossed, and of their mongrel offspring, not universal. It may be urged as an overwhelming argument that there must be some essential distinction between species and varieties, inasmuch as the latter, however much they may differ from each other in external appearance, cross with perfect facility, and yield perfectly fertile offspring. With some exceptions presently to be given, I fully admit that this is the rule, but the subject is surrounded by difficulties, for looking to varieties produced under nature, if two forms hitherto reputed to be varieties be found in any degree sterile together, they are at once ranked by most naturalists as species. For instance, the blue and red pimpernel, which are considered by most botanists as varieties, are said to be gardener, to be quite sterile when crossed, and he consequently ranks them as undoubted species. If we thus argue in a circle, the fertility of all varieties produced under nature will assuredly have to be granted. If we turn to varieties produced or supposed to have been produced under domestication, we are still involved in some doubt, for when it is stated, for instance, that certain South American indigenous domestic dogs do not readily unite with European dogs, the explanation, which will occur to everyone, and probably the true one, is that they are descended from aboriginally distinct species. Nevertheless, the perfect fertility of so many domestic races, differing widely from each other in appearance, for instance, those of the pigeon or of the cabbage, is a remarkable fact, more especially when we reflect how many species there are, which, though resembling each other most closely, are utterly sterile when intercrossed. Several considerations, however, render the fertility of domestic varieties less remarkable. In the first place, it may be observed that the amount of external difference between two species is no sure guide to their degree of mutual sterility, so that similar differences in the case of varieties would be no sure guide. It is certain that with species the cause lies exclusively in differences in their sexual constitution. Now the varying conditions to which domesticated animals and cultivated plants have been subjected 
have had so little tendency towards modifying the reproductive system in a manner leading to mutual sterility, that we have good grounds for admitting the directly opposite doctrine of Pallas, namely, that such conditions generally eliminate this tendency, so that the domesticated descendants of species, which, in their natural state, probably would have been, in some degree, sterile when crossed, became perfectly fertile together. With plants, so far as cultivation from giving a tendency towards sterility between distinct species, that in several well-authenticated cases already alluded to, certain plants have been affected in an opposite manner, for they have become self-impotent, while still retaining the capacity of fertilizing and being fertilized by other species. If the Pelasian doctrine of the elimination of sterility through long-continued domestication be admitted, and it can hardly be rejected, it becomes, in the highest degree, improbable that similar conditions long-continued should likewise induce this tendency, though in certain cases, with species having a peculiar constitution, sterility might occasionally be thus caused. Thus, as I believe, we can understand why, with domesticated animals, varieties have not been produced which are mutually sterile, and why, with plants, only a few such cases, immediately to be given, have been observed. The real difficulty in our present subject is not, as it appears to me, why domesticated varieties have not become mutually infertile when crossed, but why this has so generally occurred with natural varieties as soon as they have been permanently modified in a sufficient degree to take rank as species. We are far from precisely knowing the cause, nor is this surprising, seeing how profoundly ignorant we are in regard to the normal and abnormal action of the reproductive system. But we can see that species, owing to their struggle for existence with numerous competitors, will have been exposed during long periods of time to more uniform conditions than have domestic varieties, and this may well make a wide difference in the result, for we know how commonly wild animals and plants, when taken from their natural conditions and subjected to captivity, are rendered sterile, and the reproductive functions of organic beings, which have always lived under natural conditions, would probably, in like manner, be eminently sensitive to the influence of an unnatural cross. Domesticated productions, on the other hand, which, as shown by the mere fact of their domestication, were not originally highly sensitive to changes in their conditions of life, and which can now generally resist, with undiminished fertility, repeated changes of conditions, might be expected to produce varieties which would be little liable to have their reproductive powers injuriously affected by the act of crossing with other varieties which had originated in a like manner. I have as yet spoken as if the varieties of the same species were invariably fertile and intercrossed, but it is impossible to resist the evidence of the existence of a certain amount of sterility. In the few following cases, which I will briefly abstract, the evidence is at least as good as that from which we believe in the sterility of a multitude of species. The evidence is also derived from hostile witnesses, who in all other cases, consider fertility and sterility as safe criterions of specific distinction. Gartner kept, during several years, a dwarf kind of maize with yellow seeds, and a tall variety with red seeds growing near each other in his garden, and although these plants have separated sexes, they never naturally crossed. He then fertilized thirteen flowers of the one kind with pollen of the other, but only a single head produced any seed, and this one head produced only five grains. Manipulation in this case could not have been injurious, as the plants have separated sexes. No one, I believe, has suspected that these varieties of maize are distinct species, and it is important to notice that the hybrid plants, thus raised, were themselves perfectly fertile so that even Gardner did not venture to consider the two varieties as specifically distinct. Garou de Buzerong crossed three varieties of gourd, which, like the maize, has separated sexes.
and he asserts that their mutual fertilization is by so much the less easy as their differences are greater. How far these experiments may be trusted I know not, but the forms experimented on are ranked by Sagaret, who mainly found his classification by the test of infertility, as varieties, and Nowden has come to the same conclusion. The following case is far more remarkable, and seems, at first, incredible. But it is the result of an astonishing number of experiments made during many years on nine species of verbascum, by so good an observer and so hostile a witness as Gardner, namely, that the yellow and white varieties, when crossed, produce less seed than the similarly colored varieties of the same species. Moreover, he asserts that, when yellow and white varieties of one species are crossed with yellow and white varieties of a distinct species, more seed is produced by the crosses between the similarly colored flowers than between those which are differently colored. Mr. Scott also has experimented on the species and varieties of verbascum, and although unable to confirm Gardner's results on the crossing of the distinct species, he finds that the dissimilarly colored varieties of the same species yield fewer seeds, in the proportion of 86 to 100, than the similarly colored varieties. Yet these varieties differ in no respect, except in the color of their flowers and one variety can sometimes be raised from the seed of another. Colewriter, whose accuracy has been confirmed by every subsequent observer, has proved the remarkable fact that one particular variety of the common tobacco was more fertile than the other varieties when crossed with a widely distinct species. He experimented on five forms which are commonly reputed to be varieties, and which he tested by the severest trial, namely, by reciprocal crosses, and he found their mongrel offspring perfectly fertile. But one of these five varieties, when used either as the father or mother, and crossed with the Nicotania glutinosa, always yielded hybrids not so sterile as those which were produced from the other four varieties when crossed with Nicotania glutinosa. Hence, the reproductive system of this one variety must have been in some manner and in some degree modified. From these facts, it can no longer be maintained that varieties, when crossed, are invariably quite fertile. From the great difficulty of ascertaining the infertility of varieties in a state of nature, for a supposed variety, if proved to be infertile in any degree, would almost universally be ranked as a species. From man attending only to external characters in his domestic varieties, and from such varieties, not having been exposed for very long periods to uniform conditions of life, from these several considerations, we may conclude that fertility does not constitute a fundamental distinction between varieties and species when crossed. The general sterility of crossed species may safely be looked at not as a special acquirement or endowment, but as incidental on changes of an unknown nature in their sexual elements. Hybrids and mongrels compared independently of their fertility. Independently of the question of fertility, the offspring of species and of varieties when crossed may be compared in several other respects. Gartner, whose strong wish it was to draw a distinct line between species and varieties, could find very few, and, as it seems to me, quite unimportant differences between the so-called hybrid offspring of species and the so-called mongrel offspring of varieties. And, on the other hand, they agree most closely in many important respects. I shall here discuss this subject with extreme brevity. The most important distinction is that in the first generation, Mongrels are more variable than hybrids, but Gartner admits that hybrids from species which have long been cultivated are often variable in the first generation, and I have myself seen striking instances of this fact. Gartner further admits that hybrids between very closely allied species are more variable than those from very distinct species, and this shows that the difference in the degree of variability graduates away 
when mongrels and the more fertile hybrids are propagated for several generations, an extreme amount of variability in the offspring, in both cases, is notorious. But in some few instances of both hybrids and mongrels, long retaining a uniform character could be given. The variability, however, in the successive generations of mongrels is, perhaps, greater than in hybrids. This greater variability in mongrels than in hybrids does not seem at all surprising, for the parents of mongrels are varieties, and mostly domestic varieties, very few experiments having been tried on natural varieties, and this implies that there has been recent variability, which would often continue, and would augment that arising from the act of crossing. The slight variability of hybrids in the first generation, in contrast with that in the succeeding generations, is a curious fact and deserves attention, for it bears on the view which I have taken of one of the causes of ordinary variability, namely, that the reproductive system, from being eminently sensitive to changed conditions of life, fails under these circumstances to perform its proper function of producing offspring closely similar in all respects to the parent form. Now, hybrids in the first generation are descended from species, excluding those long cultivated, which have not had their reproductive systems in any way affected, and they are not variable. But hybrids themselves have their reproductive systems seriously affected, and their descendants are highly variable. But to return to our comparison of mongrels and hybrids. Gartner states that mongrels are more liable than hybrids to revert to either parent form, but this, if it be true, is certainly only a difference in degree. Moreover, Gartner expressly states that the hybrids from long cultivated plants are more subject to reversion than hybrids from species in their natural state, and this probably explains the singular difference in the results arrived at by different observers. Thus, Max Wachura doubts whether hybrids ever revert to their parent forms, and he experimented on uncultivated species of willows, while Naudin, on the other hand, insists in the strongest terms on the almost universal tendency to reversion in hybrids, and he experimented chiefly on cultivated plants. Gartner further states that when any two species, although most closely allied to each other, are crossed with a third species, the hybrids are widely different from each other, whereas if two very distinct varieties of one species are crossed with another species, the hybrids do not differ much. But this conclusion, as far as I can make out, is founded on a single experiment and seems directly opposed to the results of several experiments made by Kohlreiter. Such alone are the unimportant differences which Gartner is able to point out between hybrid and mongrel plants. On the other hand, the degrees and kinds of resemblance in mongrels and in hybrids to their respective parents, or especially in hybrids produced from nearly related species, follow, according to Gartner, the same laws. When two species are crossed, one has sometimes a prepotent power of impressing its likeness on the hybrid. So I believe it to be with varieties of plants. And with animals, one variety certainly often has this prepotent power over another variety. Hybrid plants produced from a reciprocal cross generally resemble each other closely, and so it is with mongrel plants from a reciprocal cross. Both hybrids and mongrels can be reduced to either pure parent form by repeated crosses in successive generations with either parent. These several remarks are apparently applicable to animals, but the subject is here much complicated, partly owing to the existence of secondary sexual characters, but more especially owing to prepotency in transmitting likenesses running more strongly in one sex than in the other, both when one species is crossed with another and when one variety is crossed with another variety. For instance, I think those authors are right to maintain that the ass has a prepotent power over the horse, so that both the mule and the hinning resemble more closely the ass than the horse, but that the prepotency runs more strongly in the male 
than in the female ass, so that the mule, which is an offspring of the male ass and mare, is more like an ass than is the hinny, which is the offspring of the female ass and stallion. Much stress has been laid by some authors on the supposed fact that it is only with mongrels that the offspring are not intermediate in character, but closely resemble one of their parents. But this does sometimes occur with hybrids, yet I grant much less frequently than with mongrels. Looking to the cases which I have collected of crossbred animals closely resembling one parent, the resemblances seem chiefly confined to characters almost monstrous in their nature, and which have suddenly appeared, such as albinism, melanism, deficiency of tail or horns, or additional fingers and toes and do not relate to characters which have been slowly acquired through selection. A tendency to sudden reversions to the perfect character of either parent would, also, be much more likely to occur with mongrels, which are descended from varieties often suddenly produced and semi-monstrous in character, than with hybrids, which are descended from species slowly and naturally produced. On the whole, I entirely agree with Dr. Prosper Lucas, who, after arranging an enormous body of facts with respect to animals, comes to the conclusion that the laws of resemblance of a child to its parents are the same, whether the two parents differ little or much from each other, namely, in the union of individuals of the same variety, or of different varieties, or of distinct species. Independently of the question of fertility and sterility, in all other respects there seems to be a general and close similarity in the offspring of crossed species and of crossed varieties. If we look at species as having been specially created, and at varieties as having been produced by secondary laws, this similarity would be an astonishing fact. But it harmonizes perfectly with the view that there is no essential distinction between species and varieties. Summary of Chapter First crosses between forms, sufficiently distinct to be ranked as species, and their hybrids, are very generally, but not universally, sterile. The sterility is of all degrees, and is often so slight, that the most careful experimentalists have arrived at diametrically opposite conclusions in ranking forms by this test. The sterility is innately variable in individuals of the same species, and is eminently susceptible to action of favorable and unfavorable conditions. The degree of sterility does not strictly follow systematic affinity, but is governed by several curious and complex laws. It is generally different, and sometimes widely different, in reciprocal crosses between the same two species. It is not always equal in degree in a first cross, and in the hybrids produced from this cross. In the same manner as in grafting trees, the capacity in one species or variety to take on another is incidental on differences generally of an unknown nature in their vegetative systems. So in crossing, the greater or less facility of one species to unite with another is incidental on unknown differences in their reproductive systems. There is no more reason to think that species have been specially endowed with various degrees of sterility to prevent their crossing and blending in nature than to think that trees have been specially endowed with various and somewhat analogous degrees of difficulty in being grafted together in order to prevent their inarching in our forests. The sterility of first crosses and of their hybrid progeny has not been acquired through natural selection. In the case of first crosses, it seems to depend on several circumstances, in some instances, in chief part, on the early death of the embryo. In the case of hybrids, it apparently depends on their whole organization having been disturbed by being compounded from two distinct forms, the sterility being closely allied to that which so frequently affects pure species when exposed to new and unnatural conditions of life. He who will explain these latter cases will be able to explain the sterility of hybrids. This view is strongly supported by a parallelism of another kind, namely, that, firstly, 
slight changes in the conditions of life add to the vigor and fertility of all organic beings, and, secondly, that the crossing of forms which have been exposed to slightly different conditions of life, or which have varied, favors the size, vigor, and fertility of their offspring. The facts given on the sterility of the illegitimate unions of dimorphic and trimorphic plants, and of their illegitimate progeny, perhaps render it probable that some unknown bond, in all cases, connects the degree of fertility of first unions with that of their offspring. The consideration of these facts on dimorphism, as well as the results of reciprocal crosses, clearly leads to the conclusion that the primary cause of the sterility of crossed species is confined to differences in their sexual elements. But why, in the case of distinct species, the sexual elements should so generally have become more or less modified, leading to their mutual infertility, we do not know, but it seems to stand in some close relation to species having been exposed for long periods of time to nearly uniform conditions of life. It is not surprising that the difficulty in crossing any two species, and the sterility of their hybrid offspring, should, in most cases, correspond, even if due to distinct causes, for both depend on the amount of difference between the species which are crossed. Nor is it surprising that the facility of effecting a first cross and the fertility of the hybrids thus produced, and the capacity of being grafted together, though this latter capacity evidently depends on widely different circumstances, should all run, to a certain extent, parallel with the systematic affinity of the forms subjected to experiment. For systematic affinity includes resemblances of all kinds. First crosses between forms known to be varieties, or sufficiently alike to be considered as varieties, and their mongrel offspring, are very generally, but not, as is so often stated, invariably fertile. Nor is this almost universal and perfect fertility surprising, when it is remembered how liable we are to argue in a circle with respect to varieties in a state of nature and when we remember that the greater number of varieties have been produced under domestication by the selection of mere external differences, and that they have not been long exposed to uniform conditions of life, and when we remember that the greater number of varieties have been produced under domestication by the selection of mere external differences, and that they have not been long exposed to uniform conditions of life, it should also be especially kept in mind that long-continued domestication tends to eliminate sterility, and is therefore little likely to induce this same quality. Independently of the question of fertility, in all other respects, there is the closest general resemblance between hybrids and mongrels in their variability, in their power of absorbing each other by repeated crosses, and in their inheritance of characters from both parent forms. Finally, then, Although we are as ignorant of the precise cause of the sterility of first crosses, and of hybrids, as we are why animals and plants, removed from their natural conditions, become sterile, yet the facts given in this chapter do not seem to me opposed to the belief that species aboriginally existed as varieties. End of chapter 9, part 2 Chapter 10, Part 1 of The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 On the Imperfection of the Geological Record On the Absence of Intermediate Varieties at the Present Day On the Nature of Extinct Intermediate Varieties On the Number on the lapse of time as inferred from the rate of denudation and of deposition number, on the lapse of time as estimated by years, on the poorness of our paleontological collections, on the intermittence of geological formations, on the denudation of granitic areas 
on the absence of intermediate varieties in any one formation, on the sudden appearance of groups of species, on their sudden appearance in the lowest known fossiliferous strata, antiquity of the habitable earth. In the sixth chapter, I enumerated the chief objections which might be justly urged against the views maintained in this volume. Most of them have now been discussed. One, namely the distinctness of specific forms, and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links, is a very obvious difficulty. I assign reasons why such links do not commonly occur at the present day under the circumstances apparently most favorable for their presence, namely on an extensive and continuous area with graduated physical conditions. I endeavored to show that the life of each species depends, in a more important manner, on the presence of other, already defined, organic forms than on climate, and therefore that the really governing conditions of life do not graduate away quite insensibly, like heat or moisture. I endeavored also to show that intermediate varieties, from existing in lesser numbers than the forms which they can act, will generally be beaten out and exterminated during the course of further modification and improvement. The main cause, however, of innumerable intermediate links not now occurring everywhere throughout nature depends on the very process of natural selection, through which new varieties continually take the places of and supplant their parents' forms. But just in proportion, as this process of extermination has acted on an enormous scale, so must the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed be truly enormous. Why, then, is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. In the first place, it should always be borne in mind what sort of intermediate forms must, on the theory, have formerly existed. I have found it difficult, when looking at my two species, to avoid picturing to myself forms directly intermediate between them. But this is a wholly false view. We should always look for forms intermediate between each species, and a common but unknown progenitor, and the progenitor will generally have differed in some respects from all its modified descendants. To give a simple illustration. The fantail and pouter pigeons are both descended from the rock pigeon. If we possessed all the intermediate varieties which have ever existed, we should have an extremely close series between both and the rock pigeon, but we should have no varieties directly intermediate between the fantail and pouter. None, for instance, combining a tail somewhat expanded with a crop somewhat enlarged, the characteristic features of those two breeds. These two breeds, moreover, have become so much modified that, if we had no historical or indirect evidence regarding their origin, it would not have been possible to have determined, from a mere comparison of their structure with that of the rock pigeon, C. Livia, whether they had descended from this species or from some other allied species, such as C. Enus. So, with natural species, if we look to forms very distinct, for instance, to the horse and taper, we have no reason to suppose that links directly intermediate between them ever existed, but between each and an unknown common parent. The common parent will have had in its whole organization much general resemblance to the taper and to the horse, but in some points of structure may have differed considerably from both even perhaps more than they differ from each other. Hence, in all such cases, we should be unable to recognize the parent form of any two or more species, even if we closely compared the structure of the parent with that of its modified descendants, unless, at the same time, we had a nearly perfect chain of the intermediate links. It is just possible, by the theory, that one of two living forms might have descended from the other, for instance, a horse from a taper, and in this case, direct intermediate links will have existed between them. 
But such a case would imply that one form had remained for a very long period unaltered, whilst its descendants had undergone a vast amount of change, and the principle of competition between organism and organism, between child and parent, will render this a very rare event, for in all cases the new and improved forms of life tend to supplant the old and unimproved forms. By the theory of natural selection, all living species have been connected with the parent species of each genus by differences not greater than we see between the natural and domestic varieties of the same species at the present day, and these parent species, now generally extinct, have, in their turn, been similarly connected with more ancient forms, and so on backwards, always converging to the common ancestor of each great class, so that the number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extinct species must have been inconceivably great. But, assuredly, if this theory be true, such have lived upon the earth. On the lapse of time, as inferred from the rate of deposition and extent of denudation, Independently of our not finding fossil remains of such infinitely numerous connecting links, it may be objected that time cannot have sufficed for so great an amount of organic change, all changes having been effected slowly. It is hardly possible for me to recall to the reader, who is not a practical geologist, the fact leading the mind feebly to comprehend the lapse of time, he who can read Sir Charles Lyell's grand work on the principles of geology, which the future historian will recognize as having produced a revolution in natural science, and yet does not admit how vast have been the past periods of time, may at once close this volume. Not that it suffices to study the principles of geology or to read special treatises by different observers on separate formations, and to mark how each author attempts to give an inadequate idea of the duration of each formation, or even of each stratum. We can best gain some idea of past time by knowing the agencies at work, and learning how deeply the surface of a land has been denuded, and how much sediment has been deposited. As Lyle has well remarked, the extent and thickness of our sedimentary formations are the result and the measure of the denudation which the Earth's crust has elsewhere undergone. Therefore a man should examine for himself the great piles of superimposed strata, and watch the rivulets springing down mud, and the waves wearing away the sea cliffs, in order to comprehend something about the duration of past time, the monuments of which we see all around us. It is good to wander along the coast, when formed of moderately hard rocks, and mark the process of degradation. The tides, in most cases, reach the cliffs only for a short time, twice a day, and the waves eat into them only when they are charged with sand or pebbles, for there is good evidence that pure water affects nothing in wearing away rock. At last, the base of the cliff is undermined, huge fragments fall down, and these, remaining fixed, have to be worn away atom by atom, until, after being reduced in size, they can be rolled about by the waves, and then they are more quickly ground into pebbles, sand, or mud. But how often do we see, along the bases of retreating cliffs, rounded boulders, all thickly clothed by marine productions, showing how little they are abraded, and how seldom they are rolled about? Moreover, if we follow, for a few miles, any line of rocky cliff which is undergoing degradation, we find that it is only here and there, along a short length, around a promontory, that the cliffs are at the present time suffering. The appearance of the surface and the vegetation show that, elsewhere, years have elapsed since the waters washed their base. We have, however, recently learned from the observations of Ramsey, in the van of many excellent observers, of Dukes, Geike, Kroll, and others, that subaerial degradation is a much more important agency than coast action or the power of the waves. The whole surface of the land is exposed to the chemical action of the air and of the rainwater, with its dissolved carbonic acid, and in colder countries to frost, 
the disintegrated manner is carried down even gentle slopes during heavy rain, and to a greater extent than might be supposed, especially in arid districts, by the wind. It is then transported by the streams and rivers, which, when rapid, deep in their channels, and triturate the fragments. On a rainy day, even in a gently undulating country, we see the effects of subaerial degradation in the muddy rills which flow down every slope. Messrs. Ramsey and Whittaker have shown that the observation is a most striking one, that the great lines of escarpment in the Wealden district, and those ranging across England, which formerly were looked at as ancient sea coasts, cannot have been thus formed, for each line is composed of one and the same formation, while our sea cliffs are everywhere formed by the interaction of various formations. This being the case, we are compelled to admit that the escarpments owe their origin in chief part to the rocks of which they are composed, having resisted subaerial denudation better than the surrounding surface. This surface, consequently, has been gradually lowered with the lines of harder rock left projecting. Nothing impresses the mind with the vast duration of time, according to our ideas of time, more forcibly than the conviction thus gained that subaerial agencies, which apparently have so little power, and which seem to work so slowly, have produced great results. When thus impressed with the slow rate at which the land is worn away through subaerial and littoral action, it is good, in order to appreciate the past durations of time, to consider, on the one hand, the masses of rock which have been removed over many extensive areas, and, on the other hand, the thickness of our sedimentary formations. I remember having been much struck when viewing volcanic islands which have been worn by the waves and paired all around into perpendicular cliffs of one or two thousand feet in height, for the gentle slope of the lava streams, due to their formerly liquid state, showed at a glance how far the hard rocky beds had once extended into the open ocean. The same story is told still more plainly by faults those great cracks along which the strata have been upheaved on one side or thrown down on the other to a height or depth of thousands of feet, or since the crust cracked, and it makes no difference whether the upheaval was sudden, or, as most geologists now believe, was slow and defected by many starts, the surface of the land has been so completely planed down that no trace of these vast dislocations is externally visible. The Craven Fault, for instance, extends for upward of thirty miles, and along this line the vertical displacement of the strata varies from six hundred to three thousand feet. Professor Ramsey has published an account of a downthrow in Anglesey of twenty-three hundred feet, and he informs me that he fully believes that there is one in Marianthshire of twelve thousand feet. Yet in these cases there is nothing on the surface of the land to show such prodigious movements, the pile of rocks on either side of the crack having been smoothly swept away. On the other hand, in all parts of the world the piles of sedimentary strata are of wonderful thickness. In the Cordillera I estimated one mass of conglomerates at ten thousand feet, and although conglomerates have probably been accumulated at a quicker rate than finer sediments, yet from being formed of worn and rounded pebbles, each of which bears the stamp of time, they are good to show how slowly the mass must have been heaped together. Professor Ramsey has given me the maximum thickness, from actual measurement in most cases, of the successive formations in different parts of Great Britain, and this is the result. Paleozoic strata, not including igneous beds, 57,154 feet. Secondary strata, 13,190 feet. Tertiary strata, 2,240 feet, making altogether 72,584 feet. That is, very nearly 13 and three quarters British miles. Some of these formations, which are represented in England by thin beds, are thousands of feet in thickness on the continent. Moreover, some of these formations, which are represented in England by thin beds, are thousands of feet in thickness on the continent.
Moreover, between each successive formation we have, in the opinion of most geologists, blank periods of enormous length, so that the lofty pile of sedimentary rocks in Britain gives but an inadequate idea of the time which has elapsed during their accumulation. The consideration of these various facts impresses the mind almost in the same manner as does the vain endeavor to grapple with the idea of eternity. Nevertheless, this impression is partly false. Mr. Crawl, in an interesting paper, remarks that we do not err, quote, in forming too great a conception of the length of geological periods, end quote, but in estimating them by years. When geologists look at large and complicated phenomena, and then at the figures representing several million years, the two produce a totally different effect on the mind, and the figures are at once pronounced too small. In regard to subaerial denudation, Mr. Kroll shows, by calculating the known amount of sediment annually brought down by certain rivers, relatively to their areas of drainage, that 1,000 feet of solid rock, as it became gradually disintegrated, would thus be removed from the mean level of the whole area in the course of six million years. This seems an astonishing result, and some considerations lead to the suspicion that it may be too large. But if halved or quartered, it is still very surprising. Few of us, however, know what a million really means. Mr. Kroll gives the following illustration. Take a narrow strip of paper, 83 feet 4 inches in length, and stretch it along the wall of a large hall, and then mark off at one end the tenth of an inch. This tenth of an inch will represent 100 years, and the entire strip a million years. But let it be borne in mind, in relation to the subject of this work, what a hundred years implies represented as it is by a measure utterly insignificant in a hall of the above dimension, several eminent breeders, during a single lifetime, have so largely modified some of the higher animals, which propagate their kind much more slowly than most of the lower animals, that they have formed what well deserves to be called a new sub-breed. Few men have attended with due care to any one strain for more than half a century, so that a hundred years represents the work of two breeders in succession. It is not to be supposed that species in a state of nature ever change so quickly as domestic animals under the guidance of methodical selection. The comparison would be in every way fairer with the effects which follow from unconscious selection, that is, the preservation of the most useful or beautiful animals, with no intention of modifying the breed. But by this process of unconscious selection, various breeds have been sensibly changed in the course of two or three centuries. Species, however, probably change much more slowly, and within the same country, only a few change at the same time. This slowness follows from all the inhabitants of the same country being already so well adapted to each other, that new places in the polity of nature do not occur until after long intervals, due to the occurrence of physical changes of some kind, or through the emigration of new forms. Moreover, variations, or individual differences, of the right nature, by which some of the inhabitants might be better fitted to their new places under the altered circumstance, would not always occur at once. Unfortunately, we have no means of determining, according to the standard of years, how long a period it takes to modify a species. But to the subject of time, we must return. On the Poorness of Paleontological Collections Now let us turn to our richest museums, and what a paltry display we behold. That our collections are imperfect is admitted by everyone. The remark of that admirable paleontologist, Edward Forbes, should never be forgotten, namely, that very many fossil species are known and named from single and often broken specimens, or from a few specimens collected on some one spot. Only a small portion of the surface of the earth has been geologically explored, and no part with sufficient care, as the important discoveries made every year in Europe prove. No organism wholly soft can be preserved, 
shells and stones decay and disappear when left on the bottom of the sea, where sediment is not accumulating, we probably take a quite erroneous view when we assume that sediment is being deposited over nearly the whole bed of the sea at a rate sufficiently quick to embed and preserve fossil remains. Throughout an enormously large proportion of the ocean, the bright blue tint of the water bespeaks its purity. The many cases on record of a formation conformably covered, after an immense interval of time, by another and later formation, without the underlying bed having suffered in the interval, any wear or tear, seem explicable only on the view of the bottom of the sea not rarely lying for ages in an unaltered condition. The remains which do become embedded, if in sand or gravel, will, when the beds are upraised, generally be dissolved by the percolation of rain water charged with carbonic acid. Some of the many kinds of animals which live on the beach between high and low water mark seem to be rarely preserved. For instance, the several species of the Thomolini, a subfamily of sessile cirripedes, coat the rocks all over the world in infinite numbers. They are all strictly littoral, with the exception of a single Mediterranean species which inhabits deep water, and this has been found fossil in Sicily whereas not one other species has hitherto been found in any tertiary formation. Yet it is known that the genus Cathamalus existed during the chalk period. Lastly, many great deposits requiring a vast length of time for their accumulation are entirely destitute of organic remains, without our being able to assign any reason. One of the most striking instances is that of the Fleisch formation, which consists of shale and sandstone, several thousand, occasionally even six thousand feet in thickness, and extending for at least three hundred miles from Vienna to Switzerland. And although this great mass has been most carefully searched, no fossils, except a few vegetable remains, have been found. With respect to the terrestrial productions which lived during the secondary and Paleozoic periods, it is superfluous to state that our evidence is fragmentary in an extreme degree. For instance, until recently, not a land shell was known belonging to either of these vast periods, with the exception of one species discovered by Sir C. Lyell and Dr. Dawson in the Carboniferous strata of North America. But now, land shells have been found in the Lias. In regard to mammiferous remains, a glance at the historical table published in Lyell's manual will bring home the truth, how accidental and rare is their preservation, far better than pages of detail. Nor is their rarity surprising when we remember how large a proportion of the bones of tertiary mammals have been discovered either in caves or in lacustrine deposits and that not a cave or true lacustrine bed is known belonging to the age of our secondary or paleozoic formations. But the imperfection in the geological record largely results from another and more important case than any of the foregoing, namely, from the several formations being separated from each other by wide intervals of time. This doctrine has been emphatically admitted by many geologists and paleontologists who, like E. Forbes, entirely disbelieve in the change of species. When we see the formations tabulated in written works, or when we follow them in nature, it is difficult to avoid believing that they are closely consecutive. But we know, for instance, from Sir R. Murchison's great work on Russia, what wide gaps there are in that country between the superimposed formations. So it is in North America and in many other parts of the world. The most skillful geologist, if his attention had been confined exclusively to these large territories, would never have suspected that during the periods which were blank and barren in his own country, great piles of sediment, charged with new and peculiar forms of life, had elsewhere been accumulated. And if, in every separate territory, hardly any idea can be formed of the length of time which has elapsed between the consecutive formations, we may infer that this could nowhere be ascertained. The frequent and great changes in the mineralogical composition of consecutive formations 
generally implying great changes in the geography of the surrounding lands, whence the sediment was derived, accord with the belief of vast intervals of time having elapsed between each formation. We can, I think, see why the geological formations of each region are almost invariably intermittent, that is, have not followed each other in close sequence. Scarcely any facts struck me more when examining many hundred miles of the South American coasts, which have been upraised several hundred feet within the recent period, than the absence of any recent deposits sufficiently extensive to last even for a short geological period. Along the whole west coast, which is inhabited by a peculiar marine fauna, tertiary beds are so poorly developed that no record of several successive and peculiar marine faunas will probably be preserved to a distant age. A little reflection will explain why, along the rising coast of the western side of South America, no extensive formations with recent or tertiary remains can anywhere be found, though the supply of sediment must for ages have been great from the enormous degradation of the coast rocks and from the muddy streams entering the sea. The explanation, no doubt, is that the littoral and sublittoral deposits are continually worn away as soon as they are brought up by the slow and gradual rising of the land within the grinding action of the coast waves. We may, I think, conclude that sediment must be accumulated in extremely thick, solid, or extensive masses in order to withstand the incessant action of the waves when first upraised and during subsequent oscillations of level, as well as the subsequent subaerial degradation. Such thick and extensive accumulations of sediment may be formed in two ways, either in profound depths of the sea, in which case the bottom will not be inhabited by so many and such varied forms of life as the more shallow seas, and the mass, when upraised, will give an imperfect record of the organisms which existed in the neighborhood during the period of its accumulation. Or, Sediment may be deposited to any thickness and extent over a shallow bottom, if it continues slowly to subside. In this latter case, as long as the rate of subsidence and supply of sediment nearly balance each other, the sea will remain shallow and favorable for many and varied forms, and thus a rich fossiliferous formation, thick enough, when upraised, to resist a large amount of denudation, may be formed. I am convinced that nearly all our ancient formations, which are throughout the greater part of their thickness rich in fossils, have thus been formed during subsidence. Since publishing my views on this subject in 1845, I have watched the progress of geology, and have been surprised to note how author after author, in treating of this or that great formation, has come to the conclusion that it was accumulated during subsidence. I may add that the only ancient tertiary formation on the west coast of South America, which has been bulky enough to resist such degradation as it has yet suffered, but which will hardly last to a distant geological age, was deposited during a downward oscillation of level, and thus gained considerable thickness. All geological facts tell us plainly that each area has undergone numerous slow oscillations of level, and apparently these oscillations have affected wide spaces. Consequently, formations rich in fossils and sufficiently thick and extensive to resist subsequent degradation will have been formed over wide spaces during periods of subsidence, but only where the supply of sediment was sufficient to keep the sea shallow and to embed and preserve the remains before they had time to decay. On the other hand, as long as the bed of the sea remained stationary, thick deposits cannot have been accumulated in the shallow parts which are the most favorable to life. Still less can this have happened during the alternate periods of elevation, or, to speak more accurately, the beds, which were then accumulated, will generally have been destroyed by being upraised and brought within the limits of the coast action. These remarks apply chiefly to littoral and sublittoral deposits. In the case of an extensive and shallow sea, such as that within a large part of the Malay archipelago, 
where the depth varies from thirty or forty to sixty fathoms, a widely extended formation might be formed during a period of elevation, and yet not suffer excessively from denudation during its slow upheaval. But the thickness of the formation could not be great, for, owing to the elevatory movement, it would be less than the depth in which it was formed, nor would the deposit be much consolidated, or be capped by overlying formations, so that it would run a good chance of being worn away by atmospheric degradation, and by the action of the sea during subsequent oscillations of level. It has, however, been suggested by Mr. Hopkins, that if one part of the area, after rising and before being denuded, subsided, the deposit formed during the rising movement, though not thick, might afterwards become protected by fresh accumulations, and thus be preserved for a long period. Mr. Hopkins also expresses his belief that sedimentary beds of considerable horizontal extent have rarely been completely destroyed. But all geologists, excepting the few who believe that our present metamorphic schists and plutonic rocks once formed of the primordial nucleus of the globe, will admit that these latter rocks have been stripped of their covering to an enormous extent, for it is scarcely possible that such rocks could have been solidified and crystallized while uncovered. But, if the metamorphic action occurred at profound depths of the ocean, the former protecting mantle of rock may not have been very thick. Admitting, then, that gneiss, mica, schist, granite, diorite, etc., were once necessarily covered up, how can we account for the naked and extensive areas of such rocks in many parts of the world, except on the belief that they have subsequently been completely denuded of all overlying strata. That such extensive areas do exist cannot be doubted. The granitic region of Perim is described by Humboldt as being at least nineteen times as large as Switzerland. South of the Amazon, view colors an area composed of rocks of this nature as equal to that of Spain, France, Italy, part of Germany, and the British Isles, all conjoined. This region has not been carefully explored, but from the concurrent testimony of travelers, the granitic area is very large. Thus, von Eschweg gives a detailed section of these rocks stretching from Rio de Janeiro for 260 geographical miles inland in a straight line and I traveled for 150 miles in another direction, and saw nothing but granitic rocks. Numerous specimens collected along the whole coast, from near Rio de Janeiro to the mouth of the Plata, a distance of 1,100 geographical miles, were examined by me, and they all belonged to this class. Inland, along the whole northern bank of the Plata, I saw... Besides modern tertiary beds, only one small patch of slightly metamorphosed rock, which alone could have formed a part of the original capping of the granitic series. Turning to a well-known region, namely to the United States and Canada, as shown in Professor H. D. Rogers' beautiful map, I have estimated the areas by cutting out and weighing the paper, and I find that the metamorphic, excluding the, quote, semi-metamorphic, end quote, and granite rocks exceed in the proportion of 19 to 12.5 the whole of the newer Paleozoic formations. In many regions, the metamorphic and granite rocks would be found much more widely extended than they appear to be, if all the sedimentary beds were removed which rest unconformably on them, and which could not have formed part of the original mantle under which they were crystallized. Hence, it is probable that in some parts of the world whole formations have been completely denuded, with not a wreck left behind. One remark is here worth a passing notice. During periods of elevation, the area of the land and of the adjoining shoal parts of the sea will be increased, and new stations will often be formed 
all circumstances favorable, as previously explained, for the formation of new varieties and species. But during such periods there will generally be a blank in the geological record. On the other hand, during subsidence, the inhabited area and number of inhabitants will decrease, excepting on the shores of a continent when first broken up into an archipelago, and consequently, during subsidence, though there will be much extinction, few new varieties or species will be formed, and it is during these very periods of subsidence that the deposits which are richest in fossils have been accumulated. On the absence of numerous intermediate varieties in any single formation. From these several considerations, it becomes much more difficult to understand why we do not therein find closely graduated varieties between the allied species which lived at its commencement and at its close. Several cases are on record of the same species presenting varieties in the upper and lower parts of the same formation. Thus, Trouchold gives a number of instances with ammonites and Hilgendorf has described a most curious case of ten graduated forms of Planorbis multiformis in the successive beds of the freshwater formation in Switzerland. Although each formation has indisputably required a vast number of years for its deposition, several reasons can be given why each should not commonly include a graduated series of links between the species which lived at its commencement and close but I cannot assign due proportional weight to the following considerations. Although each formation may mark a very long lapse of years, each probably is short compared with the period requisite to change one species into another. I am aware that two paleontologists whose opinions are worthy of much defense, namely Braun and Woodward, have concluded that the average duration of each formation is twice or thrice as long as the average duration of specific forms. But insuperable difficulties, as it seems to me, prevent us from coming to any just conclusion on this head. When we see a species first appearing in the middle of any formation, it would be rash in the extreme to infer that it had not elsewhere previously existed. So again, when we find a species disappearing before the last layers have been deposited, it would be equally rash to suppose that it then became extinct. We forget how small the area of Europe is compared with the rest of the world, nor have the several stages of the same formation throughout Europe been correlated with perfect accuracy. We may safely infer that with marine animals of all kinds, there has been a large amount of migration due to climatal and other changes, and when we see a species first appearing in any formation, the probability is that it only then first immigrated into that area. It is well known, for instance, that several species appear somewhat earlier in the Paleozoic beds of North America than in those of Europe, time having apparently been required for their migration from the American to the European seas. In examining the latest deposits in various quarters of the world, it has everywhere been noted that some few still existing species are common in the deposit, but have become extinct in the immediately surrounding sea, or, conversely, that some are now abundant in the neighboring sea, but are rare or absent in this particular deposit. It is an excellent lesson to reflect on the ascertained amount of migration of the inhabitants of Europe during the glacial epoch, which forms only a part of one whole geological period, and likewise to reflect on the changes of level, on the extreme change of climate, and on the great lapse of time, all included within this same glacial period. Yet it may not be doubted whether, in any quarter of the world, Sedimentary deposits, including fossil remains, have gone on accumulating within the same area during the whole of this period. It is not, for instance, probable that sediment was deposited during the whole of the glacial period near the mouth of the Mississippi, within that limit of depth at which marine animals can best flourish.
where we know that great geographical changes occurred in other parts of America during this space of time. When such beds as were deposited in shallow water near the mouth of the Mississippi during some part of the glacial period shall have been appraised, organic remains will probably first appear and disappear at different levels owing to the migrations of species and to geographical changes. And in the distant future, a geologist examining these beds would be tempted to conclude that the average duration of life of the embedded fossils had been less than that of the glacial period, instead of having been really far greater, that is, extending from before the glacial epoch to the present day. In order to get a perfect gradation between two forms in the upper and lower parts of the same formation, the deposit must have gone on continuously accumulating during a long period, sufficient for the slow process of modification. Hence, the deposit must be a very thick one, and the species undergoing change must have lived in the same district throughout the whole time. But we have seen that a thick formation fossiliferous throughout its entire thickness, can accumulate only during a period of subsidence, and to keep the depth approximately the same, which is necessary, that the same marine species may live on the same space, the supply of sediment must nearly counterbalance the amount of subsidence, but this same movement of subsidence will tend to submerge the area whence the sediment is derived, and thus diminish the supply whilst the downward movement continues. In fact, this nearly exact balancing between the supply of sediments and the amount of subsidence is probably a rare contingency, for it has been observed by more than one paleontologist that very thick deposits are usually barren of organic remains, except near their upper or lower limits. It would seem that each separate formation, like the whole pile of formations in any country, has generally been intermittent in its accumulation. When we see, as is so often the case, a formation composed of beds of widely different mineralogical composition, we may reasonably suspect that the process of deposition has been more or less interrupted. Nor will the closest imperfection of a formation give us any idea of the length of time which its deposition may have consumed. Many instances could be given of beds, only a few feet in thickness, representing formations which are elsewhere thousands of feet in thickness, and which must have required an enormous period for their accumulation. Yet no one ignorant of this fact would have even suspected the vast lapse of time represented by the thinner formation. Many cases could be given of the lower beds of a formation having been upraised, denuded, submerged, and then recovered by the upper beds of the same formation, facts showing what wide yet easily overlooked intervals have occurred in its accumulation. In other cases, we have the plainest evidence in great fossilized trees still standing upright as they grew, of many long intervals of time and changes of level during the process of deposition, which would not have been suspected had not the trees been preserved. Thus, Sir C. Lyell and Dr. Dawson found carboniferous beds 1,400 feet thick in Nova Scotia, with ancient roots bearing strata, one above the other, at no less than sixty-eight different levels. Hence, when the same species occurs at the bottom, middle, and top of a formation, the probability is that it has not lived on the same spot during the whole period of deposition, but has disappeared and reappeared, perhaps many times, during the same geological period. Consequently, if it were to undergo a considerable amount of modification during the deposition of any one geological formation, a section would not include all the fine intermediate gradations which must, on our theory, have existed, but abrupt, though perhaps slight, changes of form. It is all important to remember that naturalists have no golden rule by which to distinguish species and varieties. They grant some little variability to each species, but when they meet with a somewhat greater amount of difference between any two forms, 
they rank both as species, unless they are enabled to connect them together by the closest intermediate gradations, and this, from the reasons just assigned, we can seldom hope to effect in any one geological section. Supposing B and C to be two species, and a third, A, to be found in an older and underlying bed. Even if A were strictly intermediate between B and C, it would be simply ranked as a third and distinct species, unless at the same time it could be closely connected by intermediate varieties with either one or both forms. Nor should it be forgotten, as before explained, that A might be the actual progenitor of B and C, and yet would not necessarily be strictly intermediate between them in all respects, so that we might obtain the parent species and its several modified descendants from the lower and upper beds of the same formation, and unless we obtained numerous transitional gradations, we should not recognize their blood relationship, and should consequently rank them as distinct species. It is notorious on what excessively slight differences many paleontologists have founded in their species, and they do this the more readily if the specimens come from very different sub-stages of the same formation. Some experienced conchologists are now sinking many of the very fine species of Deorbigny and others into the rank of varieties and on this view we do find the kind of evidence of change which on the theory we ought to find look again at the later tertiary deposits which include many shells believed by the majority of naturalists to be identical with existing species but some excellent naturalists as agassi and pictet maintain that all these tertiary species are specifically distinct though the distinction is admitted to be very slight, so that here, unless we believe that these eminent naturalists have been misled by their imaginations, and that these late tertiary species really present no difference whatever from their living representatives, or unless we admit, in opposition to the judgment of most naturalists, that these tertiary species are all truly distinct from the recent we have evidence of the frequent occurrence of slight modifications of the kind required. If we look to rather wider intervals of time, namely, to distinct and consecutive stages of the same great formation, we find that the embedded fossils, though universally ranked as specifically different, yet are far more closely related to each other than are the species found in more widely separated formations, so that here again we have undoubted evidence of change in the direction required by the theory. But to this latter subject I shall return in the following chapter. With animals and plants that propagate rapidly and do not wander much, there is reason to suspect, as we have formerly seen, that their varieties are generally at first local, and that such local varieties do not spread widely and supplant their parent form until they have been modified and perfected in some considerable degree. According to this view, the chance of discovering in a formation, in any one country, all the early stages of transition between any two forms is small, for the successive changes are supposed to have been local or confined to some one spot. Most marine animals have a wide range, and we have seen that with plants, it is those which have the widest range that oftenest present varieties, so that, with shells and other marine animals, it is probable that those which had the widest range, far exceeding the limits of the known geological formations in Europe, have oftenest given rise, first to local varieties, and ultimately to new species and this, again, would greatly lessen the chance of our being able to trace the stages of transition in any one geological formation. It is a more important consideration, leading to the same result, as lately insisted on by Dr. Falconer, 
namely that the period during which each species underwent modification, though long as measured by years, was probably short in comparison with that during which it remained without undergoing any change. It should not be forgotten that at the present day, with perfect specimens for examination, two forms can seldom be connected by intermediate varieties, and thus proved to be the same species until many specimens are collected from many places, and with fossil species this can rarely be done. We shall, perhaps, best perceive the improbability of our being enabled to connect species by numerous fine intermediate fossil links by asking ourselves whether, for instance, geologists at some future period will be able to prove that our different breeds of cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs are descended from a single stock or from several aboriginal stocks, or, again, whether certain sea shells inhabiting the shores of North America, which are ranked by some conchologists as distinct species from their European representatives, and by other conchologists as only varieties, are really varieties, or are, as it is called, specifically distinct. This could be effected by the future geologist only by his discovering, in a fossil state, numerous intermediate gradations, and such success is improbable in the highest degree. It has been asserted over and over again by writers who believe in the immutability of species that geology yields no linking forms. This assertion, as we shall see in the next chapter, is certainly erroneous, as Sir J. Lubbock has remarked, quote, Every species is a link between other allied forms. End quote. If we take a genus having a score of species recent and extinct, and destroy four fifths of them, no one doubts that the remainder will stand much more distinct from each other if the extreme forms in the genus happen to have been thus destroyed. The genus itself will stand more distinct from other allied genera. What geological research has not revealed is the former existence of infinitely numerous gradations, as fine as existing varieties, connecting together nearly all existing and extinct species. But this ought not to be expected. Yet this has been repeatedly advanced as a most serious objection against my views. It may be worthwhile to sum up the foregoing remarks on the causes of the imperfection of the geological record under an imaginary illustration. The Malay archipelago is about the size of Europe, from the North Cape to the Mediterranean, and from Britain to Russia, and therefore equals all the geological formations which have been examined with any accuracy, excepting those of the United States of America. I fully agree with Mr. Godwin Austin that the present condition of the Malay archipelago, with its numerous large islands separated by wide and shallow seas, probably represents the former state of Europe while most of our formations were accumulating. The Malay archipelago is one of the richest regions in organic beings. Yet if all the species were to be collected which have ever lived there, how imperfectly would they represent the natural history of the world? But we have every reason to believe that the terrestrial productions of the archipelago would be preserved in an extremely imperfect manner in the formations which we supposed to be there accumulating. Not many of the strictly littoral animals, or of those which lived on naked submarine rocks, would be embedded and those embedded in gravel or sand would not endure to a distant epoch. Wherever sediment did not accumulate on the bed of the sea, or where it did not accumulate at a sufficient rate to protect organic bodies from decay, no remains could be preserved. Formations rich in fossils of many kinds, and of thickness sufficient to last to an age as distant in futurity as the secondary formations lie in the past, 
would generally be formed in the archipelago only during periods of subsidence. These periods of subsidence would be separated from each other by immense intervals of time, during which the area would be either stationary or rising. Whilst rising, the fossiliferous formations on the steeper shores would be destroyed almost as soon as accumulated by the incessant coast action, as we now see on the shores of South America. Even throughout the extensive and shallow seas within the archipelago, sedimentary beds could hardly be accumulated of great thickness during the periods of elevation, or become capped and protected by subsequent deposits, so as to have a good chance of enduring to a very distant future. During the periods of subsidence, there would probably be much extinction of life. During the periods of elevation, there would be much variation, but the geological record would then be less perfect. It may be doubted whether the duration of any one great period of subsidence over the whole or part of the archipelago, together with the contemporaneous accumulation of sediment, would exceed the average duration of the same specific forms, and these contingencies are indispensable for the preservation of all the transitional gradations between any two or more species. If such gradations were not all fully preserved, transitional varieties would merely appear as so many new, though closely allied species. It is also probable that each great period of subsidence would be interrupted by oscillations of level, and that slight climactical changes would intervene during such lengthy periods, and in these cases the inhabitants of the archipelago would migrate, and no closely consecutive record of their modifications could be preserved in any one formation. Very many of the marine inhabitants of the archipelago now range thousands of miles beyond its confines, and analogy plainly leads us to the belief that it would be chiefly these far-ranging species, though only some of them, which would oftenest produce new varieties, and the varieties would at first be local or confined to one place, but if possessed of any decided advantage, or when further modified and improved, they would slowly spread and supplant their parent forms. When such varieties returned to their ancient homes, as they would differ from their former state in a nearly uniform, though perhaps extremely slight degree, and as they would be found embedded in slightly different sub-stages of the same formation, they would, according to the principles followed by many paleontologists, be ranked as new and distinct species. If then there be some degree of truth in these remarks, we have no right to expect to find, in our geological formations, an infinite number of those fine transitional forms which, on our theory, have connected all the past and present species of the same group into one long and branching chain of life. We ought only to look for a few links, and such, assuredly, we do find, some more distantly, some more closely, related to each other. And these links, let them be ever so close, if found in different stages of the same formation, would, by many paleontologists, be ranked as distinct species. But I do not pretend that I should ever have suspected how poor was the record in the best preserved geological sections, had not the absence of innumerable transitional links between the species which lived at the commencement and close of each formation pressed so hardly on my theory. End of chapter 10, part 1 Chapter 10, part 2 of The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. This recording is in the public domain. On the sudden appearance of whole groups of allied species, 
The abrupt manner in which whole groups of species suddenly appear in certain formations has been urged by several paleontologists, for instance, by Agassiz, Pictet, and Sedgwick, as a fatal objection to the belief in the transmutation of species. If numerous species, belonging to the same genera, or families, have really started into life at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of evolution through natural selection, for the development by this means of a group of forms, all of which are descended from some one progenitor, must have been an extremely slow process, and the progenitors must have lived long before their modified descendants. But we continually overrate the perfection of the geological record, and falsely infer, because certain genera or families have not been found beneath a certain stage, that they did not exist before that stage. In all cases, positive paleontological evidence may be implicitly trusted. Negative evidence is worthless, as experience has so often shown. We continually forget how large the world is, compared with the area over which our geological formations have been carefully examined. We forget that groups of species may elsewhere have long existed, and have slowly multiplied before they invaded the ancient archipelagos of Europe and the United States. We do not make due allowance for the enormous intervals of time which have elapsed between our consecutive formations, longer, perhaps, in many cases, than the time required for the accumulation of each formation. These intervals will have given time for the multiplication of species from some one parent form, and, in the succeeding formation, such groups or species will appear as if suddenly created. I may here recall a remark formerly made, namely, that it might require a long succession of ages to adapt an organism to some new and peculiar line of life, for instance, to fly through the air, and consequently that the transitional forms would often long remain confined to some one region, but that, when this adaptation had once been effected, and a few species had thus acquired a great advantage over other organisms, a comparatively short time would be necessary to produce many divergent forms which would spread rapidly and widely throughout the world. Professor Pictet, in his excellent review of this work, in commenting on early transitional forms, and taking birds as an illustration, cannot see how the successive modifications of the anterior limbs of a supposed prototype could possibly have been of any advantage. But, Look at the penguins of the southern ocean. Have not these birds their front limbs in this precise intermediate state of, quote, neither true arms nor true wings, end quote? Yet these birds hold their place victoriously in the battle for life, for they exist in infinite numbers and of many kinds. I do not suppose that we here see the real transitional graves through which the wings of birds have passed. But what special difficulty is there in believing that it might profit the modified descendants of the penguin, first to become enabled to flap along the surface of the sea, like the locker-headed duck, and ultimately to rise from its surface and glide through the air? I will now give a few examples to illustrate the foregoing remarks, and to show how liable we are to error in supposing that whole groups of species have suddenly been produced. Even in so short an interval as that between the first and second editions of Pictet's great work on paleontology, published in 1844-46, and in 1853-57, the conclusions on the first appearance and disappearance of several groups of animals have been considerably modified, and a third edition would require still further changes. I may recall the well-known fact that in geological treatises published not many years ago, mammals were always spoken of as having abruptly come in at the commencement of the tertiary series, and now one of the richest known accumulations of fossil mammals belongs to the middle of the secondary series, and true mammals have been discovered in the new red sandstone at nearly the commencements of this great series. Cuvier used to urge that 
no monkey occurred in any tertiary stratum but now extinct species have been discovered in india south america and in europe as far back as the miocene stage had it not been for the rare accident of the preservation of footsteps in the new red sandstone of the united states who would have ventured to suppose that no less than at least thirty different bird-like animals some of gigantic size existed during that period not a fragment of bone has been discovered in these beds not long ago paleontologists maintained that the whole class of birds came suddenly into existence during the eocene period but now we know on the authority of professor owen that a bird certainly lived during the deposition of the upper green sand and still more recently that strange bird the archaeopteryx with its long lizard-like tail bearing a pair of feathers on each joint and with its wings furnished with two free claws has been discovered in the oolitic states of solenhofen hardly any recent discovery shows more forcibly than this how little we as yet know of the former inhabitants of the world i may give another instance which from having been passed under my own eyes has much struck me in a memoir on fossil sessile cirripedes i stated that from the large number of existing and extinct tertiary species from the extraordinary abundance of the individuals in many species all over the world from the arctic regions to the equator inhabiting various zones of depths from the upper tidal limits to fifty fathoms from the perfect manner in which specimens are preserved in the oldest tertiary beds from the ease with which even a fragment of a valve can be recognized from all these circumstances i inferred that had sessile cirripedes existed during the secondary periods they would have certainly have been preserved and discovered and as not one species had then been discovered in beds of this age i concluded that this great group had been suddenly developed at the commencement of the tertiary series this was a sore trouble to me adding as then i thought one more instance of the abrupt appearance of a great group of species but my work had hardly been published when a skilful paleontologist m bosquet sent me a drawing of a perfect specimen of an unmistakable sessile cirripede which he had himself extracted from the chalk of belgium and as if to make the case as striking as possible this cirripede was a famulus a very common large and ubiquitous genus of which not one species has as yet been found even in any tertiary stratum still more recently a pergoma a member of a distinct subfamily of sessile cirripedes has been discovered by mr woodward in the upper chalk so that we now have abundant evidence of the existence of this group of animals during the secondary period the case most frequently insisted on by paleontologists of the apparently sudden appearance of a whole group of species is that of the teleostean fishes low down according to a case in the chalk period this group includes the large majority of the existing species but certain jurassic and triassic forms are now commonly admitted to be teleostean and even some paleozoic forms have thus been classed by one high authority if the teleosteans had really appeared suddenly in the northern hemisphere at the commencement of the chalk formation the fact would have been highly remarkable but it would not have formed an insuperable difficulty unless it could likewise have been shown that at the same period the species were suddenly and simultaneously developed in other quarters of the world it is almost superfluous to remark that hardly any fossil fish are known from south of the equator and by running through pictet's paleontology it will be seen that very few species are known from several formations in europe some few families of fish now have a confined range the teleostean fishes might formerly have had a similarly confined range 
and after having been largely developed in some one sea, have spread widely. Nor have we any right to suppose that the seas of the world have always been so freely open from south to north as they are at present. Even at this day, if the Malay archipelago were converted into land, the tropical parts of the Indian Ocean would form a large and perfectly enclosed basin, in which any great group of marine animals might be multiplied, and here they would remain confined until some of the species became adapted to a cooler climate and were enabled to double at the southern capes of Africa or Australia, and thus reach other and distant seas. From these considerations, from our ignorance of the geology of other countries beyond the confines of Europe and the United States, and from the revolution in our paleontological knowledge affected by the discoveries of the last dozen years, it seems to me to be about as rash to dogmatize on the succession of organic forms throughout the world as it would be for a naturalist to land for five minutes on a barren point in Australia, and then to discuss the number and range of its productions. On the sudden appearance of groups of allied species in the lowest known fossiliferous strata, there is another and allied difficulty which is more serious. I allude to the manner in which a species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. Most of the arguments which have convinced me that all the existing species of the same group are descended from a single progenitor apply with equal force to the earliest known species. For instance, it cannot be doubted that all the Cambrian and Silurian trilobites are descended from some one crustacean, which must have lived long before the Cambrian age, and which probably differed greatly from any known animal. Some of the most ancient animals, as the Nautilus, Lingula, etc., do not differ much from living species, and it cannot, on our theory, be supposed that these old species were the progenitors of all the species belonging to the same groups which have subsequently appeared, for they are not in any degree intermediate in character. Consequently, if the theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Cambrium stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, as long as are probably far longer than the whole interval from the Cambrian age to the present day, and that during these vast periods the world swarmed with living creatures. Here we encounter a formidable objection, for it seems doubtful whether the earth, in a fit state for the habitation of living creatures, has lasted long enough. Sir W. Thompson concludes that the consolidation of the crust can hardly have occurred less than twenty or more than four hundred million years ago, but probably not less than ninety-eight or more than two hundred million years. These very wide limits show how doubtful the data are, and other elements may have hereafter to be introduced into the problem. Mr. Kroll estimates that about sixty million years have elapsed since the Cambrian period, but this, judging from the small amount of organic change since the commencement of the glacial epoch, appears a very short time for the many and great mutations of life which have certainly occurred since the Cambrian formation, and the previous one hundred and forty million years can hardly be considered as sufficient for the development of the varied forms of life which already existed during the Cambrian period. It is, however, probable as Sir William Thompson insists, that the world, at a very early period, was subjected to more rapid and violent changes in its physical conditions than those now occurring, that such changes would have tended to induce changes at a corresponding rate in the organisms which then existed. To the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. Several eminent geologists, with Sir R. Murchison at their head, 
were until recently convinced that we beheld, in the organic remains of the lowest Silurian stratum, the first dawn of life. Other highly competent judges, as Lyle and E. Forbes, have disputed this conclusion. We should not forget that only a small portion of the world is known with accuracy. Not very long ago, M. Berand added another and lower stage, abounding with new and peculiar species, beneath the then known Silurian system, and now, still lower down in the lower Cambrian formation, Mr. Hicks has found South Wales beds, rich in trilobites, and containing various mollusks and annelids. The presence of phosphatic nodules and bituminous matter, even in some of the lowest azotic rocks, probably indicates life at these periods. And the existence of the Aezoan in the Laurentian formation of Canada is generally admitted. There are three great series of strata beneath the Silurian system in Canada, in the lowest of which the Eozoan is found. Sir W. Logan states that their, quote, united thickness may possibly far surpass that of all the succeeding rocks from the base of the Paleozoic series to the present time. We are thus carried back to a period so remote that the appearance of the so-called primordial fauna of Berand may by some be considered as a comparatively modern event, end quote. The Aezoan belongs to the most lowly organized of all classes of animals, but is highly organized for its class. It existed in countless numbers, and, as Dr. Dawson has remarked, certainly preyed on other minute organic beings which must have lived in great numbers. Thus the words which I wrote in 1859 about the existence of living beings long before the Cambrian period, and which are almost the same with those since used by Sir W. Logan, have been proved true. Nevertheless, the difficulty of assigning any good reason for the absence of vast piles of strata rich in fossils beneath the Cambrian system is very great. It does not seem probable that the most ancient beds have been quite worn away by denudation, or that their fossils have been wholly obliterated by metamorphic action, for if this had been the case, we should have found only small remnants of the formations next succeeding them in age, and these would always have existed in a partially metamorphosed condition. But the descriptions which we possess of the Silurian deposits over immense territories in Russia and in North America do not support the view that the older a formation is, the more invariably it has suffered extreme denudation and metamorphism. The case at present must remain inexplicable, and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. To show that it may hereafter receive some explanation, I will give the following hypothesis. From the nature of the organic remains, which do not appear to have inhabited profound depths in the several formations of Europe and of the United States, and from the amount of sediment, miles in thickness, of which the formations are composed, we may infer that from first to last large islands, or tracts of land, whence the sediment was derived, occurred in the neighborhood of the now existing continents of Europe and North America. This same view has since been maintained by Agassiz and others, but we do not know what the state of things in the intervals between the successive formations, whether Europe and the United States during these intervals existed as dry land, or as a submarine surface near land on which sediment was not deposited, or as the bed of an open and unfathomable sea. Looking to the existing oceans, which are thrice as extensive as the land, we see them studded with many islands, but hardly one truly oceanic island, with the exception of New Zealand, if this can be called a truly oceanic island, is as yet known to afford even a remnant of any Paleozoic or secondary formation. Hence, we may, perhaps, infer that during the Paleozoic and secondary periods, 
neither continents nor continental islands existed where our oceans now extend, hence we may perhaps infer that during the Paleozoic and Secondary periods neither continents nor continental islands existed where our oceans now extend, for had they existed, Paleozoic and Secondary formations would, in all probability, have been accumulated from sediment derived from their wear and tear, and would have been at least partially upheaved by the oscillations of level, which must have intervened during these enormously long periods. If, then, we may infer anything from these facts, we may infer that, where our oceans now extend, oceans have extended from the remotest period of which we have any record, and, on the other hand, that where continents now exist, large tracts of land have existed, subjected, no doubt, to great oscillations of level since the Cambrian period. The colored map appended to my volume on coral reefs led me to conclude that the great oceans are still mainly areas of subsidence, the great archipelagos still areas of oscillations of level, and the continents areas of elevation. But we have no reason to assume that things have thus remained from the beginning of the world. Our continents seem to have been formed by a preponderance, during many oscillations of level, of the force of elevation. But may not the areas of preponderant movement have changed in the lapse of ages? At a period long antecedent to the Cambrian epoch, continents may have existed where oceans are now spread out, and clear and open oceans may have existed where our continents now stand. Nor should we be justified in assuming that if, for instance, the bed of the Pacific Ocean were now converted into a continent, we should there find sedimentary formations in recognizable condition, older than the Cambrian strata, supposing such to have been formerly deposited. For it might well happen that strata which had subsided some miles nearer to the center of the earth, and which had been pressed on by an enormous weight of superincumbent water, might have undergone far more metamorphic action than strata which have always remained nearer to the surface. The immense areas in some parts of the world, for instance, in South America, of naked metamorphic rocks, which must have been heated under great pressure, have always seemed to me to require some special explanation, and we may perhaps believe that we see in these large areas the many formations long anterior to the Cambrian epoch in a completely metamorphosed and denuded condition. The several difficulties here discussed, namely that though we find in our geological formations many links between the species which now exist and which formerly existed, we do not find infinitely numerous fine transitional forms closely joining them all together. The sudden manner in which several groups of species first appear in our European formations, the almost entire absence, as at present known, of formations rich in fossils beneath the Cambrian strata, are all, undoubtedly, of the most serious nature. We see this in the fact that the most eminent paleontologists, namely Cuvier, Agassiz, Berand, Pictet, Falconer, E. Forbes, etc., and all our greatest geologists, as Lyell, Murchison, Sedgwick, etc., have unanimously, often vehemently, maintained the immutability of species. But Sir Charles Lyell now gives the support of his high authority to the opposite side, and most geologists and paleontologists are much shaken in their former belief. Those who believe that the geological record is in any degree perfect will undoubtedly at once reject my theory. For my part, following out Lyell's metaphor, I look at the geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept and written in a changing dialect. Of this history, we possess the last volume alone, relating only to two or three countries. Of this volume, only here and there a short chapter has been preserved, and of each page only here and there a few lines. 
each word of the slowly changing language, more or less different in the successive chapters, may represent the forms of life which are entombed in our consecutive formations, and which falsely appear to have been abruptly introduced. On this view, the difficulties above discussed are greatly diminished, or even disappear. End of chapter 10, part 2